Welcome back to the channel. Thanks for stopping by. I'm on a mandated break from fishing for striped bass. In the month of April, it's illegal to target striped bass, which is okay. Maryland has a pretty wide and diverse fishery to include white perch, yellow perch, bluegill, crappie, channel catfish, blue catfish, flathead catfish, white catfish, bullhead catfish, a lot of catfish, crappie, uh, largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, carp, trout, pickerel, bowfin, that's just to name a few as well as the ever controversial northern snakehead there is no fish right now that's causing more drama in this area than the northern snakehead there is camps in the let's save the snakehead and there's camps and let's harvest everyone we can um it's kind of crazy pretty heated as well so this, this time of year uh i start chasing after snakehead and two of the most common questions i get from people coming from far and wide. And when I mean far and wide, I mean people coming from hundreds and hundreds of miles to target these fish. Two of the most common questions I get are, where do you catch them and what do you catch them with? Both of these are information dense topics. So I think this is best to break it up into two parts. I think part one, the what, where, when, and how. Uh, part two being uh, lures and equipment. So I think without further ado, uh, let's get started. <clears throat> Whenever I'm targeting any species, the first thing I, stop and think about is what is important to know about the fish to help me better target them. I think it's important about this fish to know its range, both its natural and invasive locations, so you know where to go, their habitat, their physical and behavioral characteristics, what I describe as their states, and uh, seasonality is absolutely critical, ideal weather conditions, when do you want to get out after them, as well as the structure and topographical locations they congregate most heavily. Uh, the northern snakehead is invasive to the U.S. Whether you want to, whether you like it or not, they are. <laughs> they were first famously found in a pond in Crofton, Maryland, in 2002. <clears throat> Subsequently, they had an have a established population that was found in the Potomac River tidal basin in 2004, and since that time, they've spread to every major tributary of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Um, they've also been introduced through migration or uh, through introduction to other states, to Pennsylvania, Virginia, Delaware, Georgia, New Jersey, New York, North Carolina, Massachusetts, Arkansas, Illinois, California, Florida, Mississippi, Missouri. There's a whole list. Uh, they don't necessarily have established populations in all these places, but there have been reports. So if you currently don't have snakeheads in the waterway near you, <laughs> they might be coming soon. <laughs> Just stick around and wait. Uh, these fish are native to parts of Asia and Russia. Uh, they're also invasive to other countries, including Japan, where they were first introduced in 1901 via Korea. And even after immense fishing pressure, this is something that's important to note, even after immense fishing pressure, these fish still persist. Uh, the Japanese have a nickname for this fish, uh, Ragyo, which means thunderfish. Probably pronouncing that wrong, but I like saying it that way, so don't correct me. <laughs> I think it should go the way of the dinosaur. The first nickname is the nickname. It sounds so much better than dragon. I call it a dragon. <laughs> How about, I just hooked into a rock. Oh, it's way cooler. I'll, I'll leave it up to you. You tell me what sounds cooler. Uh, it's also interesting to note that this fish is an important food source for China and Korea. In fact, an estimated 500 tons of Northern snakehead are consumed annually in North Korea. And there's very good reason why. This fish is very tasty. This is the why to target this species. It's not because of a fight they put up or anything else, it's because of how good they taste. So the habitat, uh, the northern snakehead is freshwater fish, uh, but they can tolerate uh, I think up to 10 parts per million salinity. Uh, they also, while they're in migration or transit, uh, they will put themselves in conditions that are much more salty. Their preferred habitats are stagnant uh, anoxic, so low dissolved oxygen waterways with uh, mud substrate and dense aquatic vegetation, or you can find them in slow, muddy streams. Uh, this is key information because a ditch with six inches of water could be home to a 30 inch fish, and this is a real thing. Um, characteristically, physically, these fish have a dense bony skull. They are toothy, so they have long villiform Dracula mouth teeth, Dracula. <laughs> uh, their average adult length is 24 inches and 8 pounds, but they can exceed over 36 inches and weigh up to 20 uh, pounds. They are obligate air breathers, which means they must gulp air. This is a important, in fact, critical detail, uh, as gulping is a telltale sign that they are in an area. 
Um, they can also live outside of water in damp conditions for several days. Behaviorally, this fish can migrate up to 13 miles a season. That's why they push so far and wide every season, how more and more people are getting snakeheads in their waterway, not just through introduction, but through their own migrations. They're fry guarders. They guard their fry for three to four weeks. It's primarily a piscivore, so 90% of its diet when it re re reaches adulthood is that of other fish. But it's known to eat crustaceans, other invertebrates, amphibians, vertebrates. Basically anything one-third its size is fair game. It's not unheard of to find a duckling in their stomach. Uh, a study that's currently being conducted in Maryland by Josh Newhart and Dr. Joe Love had concluded that a population of 600 snakeheads can consume a maximum of 4,000 pounds of biomass a year. Uh, that's under complete and ideal circumstances, meaning they're feeding heavily all, all through all seasons, which they don't. But still, even if you cut that in half, 600 fish eating a ton of fish a year is a pretty significant biomass. So they are voracious carnivores. Snakeheads can be found in what I categorize as one of five states, actively feeding, in transit, in sanctuary, in pairing, male-female pairing, and in fry guarding mode. Uh, state one, when snakeheads are actively feeding, it's important to know that they often feed in packs. So if you find yourself catching fish away from cover, stay where you are and keep casting because you're about to catch more. It's not unheard of to catch a hundred fish at a time when they're actively feeding. In fact, the best guys are averaging 30 to 50 snakeheads a day. And I'm not talking about netting or hunting. I'm talking about rod and reel. Uh, my best day, I caught 50 snakeheads in a, pan, in a span of two hours staying in the exact same spot. And I've had that happen, close to having that happen, three or four times. So you can catch a lot of fish in a, in a span of time, like crappie. Uh, state two, when the snakeheads are in transit. So that is migration or long distance travel. As I've already mentioned, snakeheads can travel up to 13 miles a season. And the most significant migration movement occurs in the spring, but there is a second lesser migration that occurs in the fall time. Um, it's important to know that you are going to have a hard time getting a feeding response during this time. I've had hundreds of snakeheads around my kayak and could not get them to hit a lure. And I've had that happen many times, but I have been able to take my net, dip it in the water and scoop out snakeheads. I mean, I have video of me doing it. And I'm not saying the snake has stayed in the net long because uh, whenever they get into something, they are famous for being escape artists. The spring migration is for the purpose of pushing further into headwaters and finding uh, prime pairing and spawning locations. So what they're where they're moving to is they're generally moving into headwaters. And, you know, at the top of the headwaters is a generally a good place to target after them. Uh, state three that you'll find them, and you'll find them in this state quite often, is in sanctuary. They are tightly coupled to cover. Uh, they will be coupled to stump, stumps, uh, logs, laydowns, bushes, branches, marsh grasses, hydrilla, and spatterdock. That's just to name a few. But it's critical to know that when they're in this state, your lures have to be an instant strike distance before they'll engage. Uh, that is to say, it has to be casted directly on top of them. And, and if it is, sometimes they'll give chase. If it's casted directly on top of them, they'll either hit it right away, or sometimes they'll chase out from cover after it. But if you're not on top of them to begin with, you're not going to have a lot of success. That's just how it is. Uh, you're going to be casting into cover, so you need to have precision casting. Uh, you're going to have a lot of opportunity for snags, and I'd say it's important to stay on the move. They're generally not clover, uh, clustered heavily when uh, they're in sanctuary. State four, when they're in pairing mode, they can breed up to five times a year, which is pretty extraordinary considering how voracious a carnivore this fish is. Uh, this means you'll have plenty of opportunity, if you want to call it an opportunity, to find them in this state. They pair up, they perform a ritualized courtship, it's pretty cool to see. Whenever you see it, you'll see a lot of bubbling, a lot of splashing, a lot of wrapping around each other. Some snakeheads form a tight ball, so they ball themselves up. It's actually a pretty unique thing to see. Uh, the unfortunate thing is it's a pretty tough bite. Uh, they typically do this uh, courtship at uh, dawn and dusk. Um, and even though it's hard to get them to bite during this period of time, what I have found is that at high noon, for some reason, and I've done this on many different occasions, 
at high noon, I've been able to get the best feeding response when they're pairing. Any other time, I've gotten absolute nothing. So if you find fish that are spawning, high noon might be your best bet. So state five, fry guarding. If they're breeding five times a year, then they're going to be guarding fry five times a year. So you'll encounter this state quite frequently. Uh, the fry congregate into a cylindrical formation that people call a fry ball. Uh, you'll see more fry movement early in the morning and late in the afternoon. And the telltale sign that it's a fry ball and not just fry is that you'll see them bubbling at the surface, so gulping air. And to me, the most telling sign is that you'll often see them moving across open water. No normal fry do this because they're just a target at that point. Uh, that's because they're being herded around the water by a male who is shepherding them to feeding grounds and or safe locations. Um, as a note, the best tactic is to use a hollow body of frog and cast just beyond the fry ball and then pull your uh, frog into the fry ball and just let it sit there. Uh, you can twitch it a little bit, but all you have to do is let it sit there. And if the parent hasn't been hooked before, it's about to get hooked. <laughs> But I will say that if you don't get a feeding response after five or six times of trying this, move on. You might catch the fish, but you might also be wasting your time as a parent may have been hooked previously and let back go. So you can spend all day trying to catch one fish or all day catching a bunch of fish. So I prefer the later. And really, if you find one fry ball, you're sure to fry, find some more. The next, next topic that I think is important is seasonality, the seasons. So number one, spring, uh, we're coming out of winter. Just as the water hits about 60 degrees, so the days that you have the warmer, that, I mean, as you know, if it's in shallow water, as the sun is beating down on sometimes dark substrate, it's going to heat that substrate up. The tide's coming in and out. If it's tidal, it's going to heat the ground up. The water comes over top of it and heats it up. So whenever the water in those shallow areas reaches 60 degrees or so, they will be out in force heating heavily. So as soon as that first day comes along, they'll be out there and you're going to have some really awesome days. Those are the days you can catch 50 or 100 pretty easily. Uh, and after a few uh, weeks of warm weather, they'll begin moving this migration, which is annoying. <laughs> they're feeding for five minutes and then they're migrating and not hitting anything. So they uh, spend a big portion of the early spring in migration to new territories we talked about, pushing into headwaters, finding new spawning locations, and pairing up. Uh, the best action is generally found late in the afternoon, and when the water has had a chance to heat up all day long. Uh, uh, an important indicator to look for is multiple days where the average nighttime temperature is above 50 degree Fahrenheit, and that's generally when the bite is on. So you'll have, in the spring, you'll have cold days and warm days, Cold days, that you, if you have a cold snap, my opinion is don't waste your time. Wait till you have a couple warm days consecutively and then that's your best opportunity. So two, summertime. Early in the summer, they're gonna be guided, guarding their first or second, maybe third <laughs> batch of fry. And uh, you're gonna find them in shallow, stagnant waterways. That's whatever they're gonna be a little more dispersed and you have a a much better feeding response. So either be feeding or fry guarding. Both of those states are good for you because you can get them to hit something. Uh, so as the water really starts to heat up, and I mean heats up to 90 degrees, the better action is going to be found early in the morning when the water is cool and then obviously late in the afternoon uh, when the sun goes down. So three, the fall time. You'll find them pairing up again, guarding fry some more. Uh, but they'll be feeding more frequently throughout the day. So you can target them morning, noon, and night, which is pretty great. They also, as I mentioned earlier, have a minor migration that they perform moving from the headwaters back into the main waterways, but it's less significant and less impactful to your fishing. Um, so it's a really great time to snark, target snakeheads. Then we have winter. Uh, they're mostly going to be in sanctuary during this time. Um, unless you have three consecutive warm days and then your best bet when I say warm day sometimes in the winter time you'll have three days that are 60 degrees or so and then it'll heat the waterways up and your best bet is generally live bait live minnows uh, you can get them to hit a lure people do it but it's not ne nearly as productive um, and you be fishing them at the edge of uh, spatter dock fields lay downs um, sometimes in the shallow flats but not really a hot bite the ideal fishing conditions for snakehead are pretty much like many other species. Having an overcast day is always your best friend. 
Uh, they're generally going to be out a little bit more whenever it's an overcast day because if you've been to some of these locations, you'll see that there are eagles and other birds of prey that are scooping them out of the water. I've seen it on many loca many times where an eagle swooped down, pulled one out. I've actually never seen an eagle successfully fly away with it. Every single time, the snakehead will wriggle them way their way out of the eagle's claws somehow. I mean, that just tells you how powerful these fish are and how good of escape artists they are. Uh, so overcast, a calm wind, less than 10 miles an hour. I'm, I'm talking about ideal. When it's uh, greater than 10 miles an hour, I have a really hard time getting on snakehead. I don't know what it is about uh, the wind, um, the conditions that are doing something to the snakehead, but generally I have a really tough time getting a bite unless you find a very calm cove and then the bite really isn't all that hot. So for me personally, if I'm seeing winds that are greater than 10 miles an hour, I'm thinking like, eh, do I wanna do something else? The other thing is if you're in tidal water, a moving tide, that's pretty much every tidal species that's a predator. Moving tide is very important. The next thing that's also important that isn't necessarily every species is you're looking for shallow water. So generally, whenever it's warmer conditions, you're looking for six inches to five feet. Generally, you find it somewhere in between. Water temperature, greater than 50 degrees. I'd say 60 is ideal, but as long as it's greater than 50 degrees, you definitely have a chance to get on them. And of course, low salinity. You'll find them in transit through higher salinity locations, but they typically want something that's, I believe, 10 parts per million or less. Now let's talk about some of the hot spots or the structures that are, are really the, and also the topographical locations, bathymetric as well, that you'll find the greatest congregation of snakeheads. If you've done any fishing around Maryland, you'll notice that people are always fishing off bridges. And there's a good reason why, because people catch a lot of fish, a lot of snakehead close to bridges, catch a lot of fish period next to bridges. So it's the same as many other species. But and one of the other things that are significant for snakehead are coves. If you have a long span and you have a cove breaking into that long span, that cove is generally a pretty good spot because it's usually sheltered in some way or another. And snakeheads, as we talked about, they like sheltered locations. Shallow pilings, that's another one. Stump fields, laydowns near shore, uh, marsh grass. I mean, people always say that they love marsh grass. They certainly do. But usually the marsh grass you're finding in shallow conditions. So that's why they love them. They're in shallow conditions. And if you find them in their native locations, people have them in, in uh, rice fields and, and close to grass type structure. Uh, they also like hydrilla. You'll find them floating directly over top or slightly submerged into the hydrilla, which is a great time to use top water. They usually pop up out of there. And that's usually when I get my most significant top water uh, blow ups is when they're over hydrilla. Uh, the other thing that is important about topographical information for targeting snakeheads is finding bottlenecks. There isn't a more critical topographical piece of information that you're going to get than looking for bottlenecks. So if you have a main body of water and you have a narrow passage into another larger body of water, that is the location for most predators in which you'll find them. But when you're in shallow water conditions, it's even more critical for snakehead. You're in positions like that. I call the, I give percentage to my spots that I go to as I've, as I fish them, I give a, I've been to this location, how often do I hook up on a fish? And I have some 50%, 60, 70, 80, and even have what I call colloquially some 100% spots, where pretty much every time, well, every time I've gone, I've caught at least a fish, whether it be largemouth, whether it be perch or snakehead. And bottlenecks are really great locations. So whenever you're looking on a topographical map, that is something that you definitely want to look for, I would say first and foremost. The next thing, Converging waterways. Converging waterways are critical because, especially if you find shallow flats on the edges in the winter times, and as the day warms up, those shallows, those areas are gonna warm up first, the bait fish will be pulled into there, and the next thing you know, you're gonna have some snakeheads in that water. So it's a really good idea to find uh, converging waterways that are shallow with shallow flats. And also those converging waterways are great in the summertime. You find the people that you know, they find their spot is generally on a converging waterway of some sort. So uh, that's another prime snakehead location. All right, so that wraps up part one, the what, where, when, and how to target snakeheads. Uh, part two coming up will be lures and equipment. So till then, I'll see you later.